right. Good morning, Grace Point. How you doing? Good morning. Oh, come on. I know that was like lost an hour cheer. <laughs> How you doing? Good. That still wasn't any better. We're just going to go. All right. Hey, we're in a book of Galatians right now. We've called the series Religion is Dead because that's exactly what Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, what has been done to religion. Jesus has come to destroy it. You see, many of us walk in this room week after week thinking that God's grace is something that we got to earn. God's grace is something we've got to bring upon ourselves, that we got to clean ourselves up to get God to smile upon us. But Paul is saying throughout this book, that is false. Grace is not something you can earn, and grace is not something you can uh, pay back, if you will. Years ago, I was working for my dad at a dealership in Kentucky, and uh, he gave me my first real job. And uh, so one day I'm over there, I'm cleaning some cars and he walks across the parking lot and he says, hey, do you want to go grab some lunch? And I said, sure, that sounds great. Now, usually the person who's inviting somebody to lunch pays for it, right? Well, my dad didn't know that. You see, he walked across, he said, hey, let's go to lunch. And we went to Burger King. And since I drove and since I thought my dad was going to pay for it, I ended up getting the supersized meal. Well, then I listen to my dad order. My dad gets the large meal. And as we go to the drive-thru to pay, I look at him and I hold out my hand and he just stares at me. (laughs) By this time, the window is open. The lady's just looking at us, having a staring contest. And he goes, what? My dad. He said, what? I said, aren't you going to pay? He goes, no, you owe me for the last 16 years. (laughs) He said, you pay. I stood there until it was awkward. And finally, I pulled out some money and I gave it to the person. But many of us, that's how we think God is. We think God is very generous. God's going to come in. He's going to swoop you up. He's going to save you. But you better get to work to clean it up. You better start putting in some of your own effort. But that is not the gospel. You see, the gospel is not the good news of what you have done to make yourself right with God. The gospel is the good news of what God has done to reconcile you to himself through the completed work of his son without a scrap of human assistance. And that is good news for us. You see, Paul is writing this letter to a church in Galatia that's in a modern-day Turkey that he helped to start. He had been gone for about six months to a year when he caught news that they have turned away from the gospel that he preached to them. They have deserted the gospel. They've become a turncoat to the gospel. But not only that, they started to question his apostleship. And they had a false teachers by the name of Judaizers that came into the church. And here's essentially what they would say. You got Jesus, that's great. We're not telling you to give up Jesus. But if you want the assurance and security of your salvation, you better get to work. John Stott says it like this. He says, in other words, they were essentially saying this. In other words, you must let Moses finish what Christ has begun. You must add your works to the work of Christ. You must finish Christ's unfinished work. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that good news for anyone in here? And you can only imagine how Paul was feeling as he started this church, preached to them a gospel that is completely done by Jesus, completely assured and secured by Jesus, only to see these individuals start turning to something that's false. Like a parent who loves their kids, Paul is angry, he is frustrated, and he is writing to them with a tone to let them know he is serious, that you are not, just like Ty taught last week, you're not turning from an ideology or philosophy. You are turning from a person, the one who has come to rescue you, the one who has come to save you. His name is Jesus And what Paul is going to do in this text is he's going to show us how religion doesn't change people. He's going to show us that through his life. If anybody could be changed by religion, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, the dude got, you know, all A's on his report card. I mean, his mom was always putting his grades up on the fridge. And he says it doesn't change. And that's the big idea we want to get out of this text today is that the gospel can do what religion cannot Only the gospel can bring about the change you so desire in your life. Your religious doing, your religious actions, trying to get God to smile upon you are not sufficient. You need a rescuer. So if you got your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Galatians chapter one. If you got an app, go ahead and pull it out and I'll watch your face glow. I think it's funny. Let me pray for us and then we're gonna dive into this text. Galatians 1.11, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for grace. We thank you for the fact that you came 
and assured and secured our salvation by dying for, in, our, in our place on the cross. Jesus, help us to keep our eyes on the cross, the fact that you're no longer on it, that you're resurrected, ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, declaring that you have done it all. The cross is an emphatic symbol that we can't do it. And so I pray that Jesus, by your grace, you help us to rest right there, to see that the cross is not only done for us, but by us, out of love that you had for us. So God, we love you, and I pray that you just speak to us today as we study and learn from the Apostle Paul's life. We love you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Paul starts off talking about the organic nature of his gospel. He says in verse 11, listen to this. He says, for I would have you know, brothers, to know there means to know with certainty, is to certify, is to say this is fact. I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Just like Paul didn't become an apostle through a man's doing, but through God's doing, he got his gospel from Jesus. He didn't go talk to any guy. He didn't go search it out, but rather the gospel came to him and Jesus shared it with him. And what he is saying is he absolutely didn't go to any sort of headquarters or any sort of leadership to get this message. How do we know this? Because of Paul's story in Acts chapter 9. You see, in Acts chapter 9, we read about the Apostle Paul's conversion. We read about how Jesus saved him. It says that while Paul was on his way to Damascus with letters in his hand to go kick in some doors, grab some Christians, and arrest them, while he was on his way there... Jesus met him, knocked him on his rear end, and saved him. And it's funny to me because Paul is going on his way there. It wasn't like he was looking for Jesus. He was trying to destroy Jesus to obliterate the name of Christ from the earth. And Jesus saves him on the way to do the very thing that Paul wants to do. And he says, basically, stop it. Now, you got to understand, Paul was very religious, I mean, he, he, he wasn't like terribly out of his mind. He was a fanatic, but you got to understand the culture in which he was in. God's people were living under, God, or God's people were living under the rule and reign of Rome. And as the people were living in this condition, there were certain religious sects that would get together and they would say, hey, this isn't necessarily the right way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the free people of God, but how are we going to get out from underneath this Roman tyranny? There was a group of people there called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were the liberal group theologically. They believed in the first five books of Moses, but they didn't believe in the resurrection. Therefore, they were sad, you see. (laughs) I know that's cheesy, but that's how I remember it. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And their idea was, is as they saw this Roman tyranny, they just thought, you know what? If you can't beat them, you might as well join them. So let's just hang out and play around. There was another group there called the Zealots. Now, the Zealots were kind of like the anarchists. They were the ones kind of saying, let's take them out. Literally, they would walk around with knives in their clothes, and they would go and they would like shank people and just kill them, thinking, hey, if we could just do this one at a time, maybe we could... No. But there was another group. And this is a group Paul was a part of called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were the conservative group. The Pharisees would oversee the teaching in the synagogue, and their passion was to help individuals live out the law of God through their everyday life. When you read in your Bible, especially in the Gospels, you'll hear things like it's a Sabbath day walk, which basically was a fence that they put around the Sabbath law that they would say, if you walked a certain amount of steps on the Sabbath, that was called working, therefore you break the Sabbath. And so in order to keep people from breaking the Sabbath, they would put a man-made fence around it saying, don't walk more than this many steps, right? Now, could you imagine how that would work in your house? It's Sunday or Saturday. The trash needs to go out. Your wife says, hey, take the trash out. And you're like, used up all my steps. Sorry, just probably wouldn't fly too well, would it? Probably not. The Apostle Paul was trained in this sort of teaching, and he was a master of it. 
I mean, if his parents were riding their donkey around, they'd have the bumper sticker on it saying, my son's an honor or a straight A student at, you know, the Pharisee school. And when he starts to hear about these law-less, if you will, Christians, this gospel that was being proclaimed that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, you could only imagine what the Apostle Paul was thinking. We're in this predicament in Rome because we got ourselves here by not honoring God. So therefore, the most God-honoring thing I can do is to take out those lawless Christians. And he goes after them. He violently, he so violently opposed the Christian church. Acts 26.10 says that nobody could, literally, nobody could literally get close enough to him to tell him about the gospel. And so as he's on his way to Damascus to share or to arrest people, Jesus meets him. Jesus saves him. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I find that awesome because here's the deal. Who was Saul persecuting? The church. Who does Jesus say Saul was, Paul was, his name's Paul Saul, okay? Who was he saying? Who was he saying he was persecuting? Jesus himself. Jesus so identifies with the church that if the church gets hurt, he's like, man, that hurts me too. That's how much Jesus loves you, Christian, that he identifies with you in your pain. Some of these false teachers were telling basically that Paul went up uh, to Jerusalem, got his gospel from some sort of corporate headquarters and messed it up kind of like the game telephone, if you will. You ever played the game telephone? You sit in a circle with a bunch of people. It usually starts off with some phrase, but by the end of it, they're usually making fun of the person that started with the phrase, or that's how I played it. Like, it would start off like, Frank is awesome, and it'd get to me, and i go, Frank smells like, I don't know, cheese. I don't know. Like, that's just how it would go. And they were saying, that's what Paul was trying to do. But in this text, Paul is saying, I didn't make up my gospel. I couldn't have made this up. Don't you remember who I was before Jesus saved me? I was trying to take you guys out. And if you think about it, most of us in this room wouldn't make up a gospel like this, would we? Most of us in this room, if we were to make up a gospel, it would go something kind of like this. All good people are in, all bad people are out. Some of us in this room, we believe people are intrinsically good. Therefore, most people are good. Therefore, all good people in. But let me ask you a question. Did you lock your door last night? Did you leave your door wide open? There's something inside of us that if we're honest, we know we're not good. And so what we do is we try to take a scale of good works and bad works, a, a scale of comparison, if you will, like, I'm not as bad as Hitler, but, but I'm also not like, I don't know, Walter White. I'm, I'm like in the middle. No, you won't even want to be in the middle of that. <laughs> They're all over here. And that's what we end up doing. We end up doing a comparison game to make ourselves feel better, to say, well, I'm good. I can get in. There's others of us that we don't necessarily play the good card as much as we say, hey, you know what? They're sincere, they're, they're, they're passionate. I mean, what you believe in, if you're sincere about it, if you're passionate about it, that's a good one. I'll let you in that way. But I'll tell you right now, the Apostle Paul, when he was trying to destroy the name of Jesus, was very sincere. He was very passionate, yet it wasn't right had a teacher in high school. They called him Wrong Way Joe. Well, we didn't, but they did because we would have gotten detention if we called him that. <laughs> but the reason they called him that is because he was playing a basketball game against our arch rival. And he got a rebound, and in a moment of just sheer joy, he jumped back up and put it in the basket. The only problem was it was the other team's basket. <laughs> was he sincere? Yeah. But he was dead wrong. And for 20 years, he's known as Wrong Way Cho. But there's another way we, make up a, we can make up a gospel. And we know we're not good, but we believe we can work it out. 
We basically are like the Judaizers in this text, and we'll say something, well, you know, Jesus is good, but I need to start doing this, because Jesus plus something equals what? Everything. And if I can just clean myself up and just finish the work of Jesus in my life, then God will look upon me with smile. God will look upon me with grace. The gospel is absolutely offensive to religious people, because here's what the gospel tells you. You can't do it. It's like Pastor Ty says, we are a nation of Americans, but the gospel is an American. You can't do it. You cannot clean yourself up. You cannot make yourself any more lovable to God. I love the way C.S. Lewis says it. He said, Christianity must be from God, for who else would have thought it up? Nobody. It is so offensive to our intrinsic nature. We always think, I got to clean myself up. I've got to earn it. I've got to do this. Yet the gospel looks at you and says, you can't. There's a pastor by the name of Tony Marita, and I love the way he said this. He said, the gospel is like water. You didn't invent it, but you can't live without it. And then he quotes the most interesting man in the world, and he says, please, friends, stay thirsty. That means don't go to another watering hole. The gospel is the ultimate fountain of grace that can refresh your soul. And the moment you take your eyes off of Jesus and you start to look to yourself, you're gonna be in despair. This is the good news of what God has done. The question we gotta ask ourselves is this, what are we really listening to? What is controlling your life? Years ago, I got this thing, and many of you got it too, it's called a GPS. Have you heard of this? Yeah? Like tells you where to go and stuff, except it didn't work really well when it first came out, did it? Because I got it when I lived here in Las Vegas, and since, you know, I lived here for 10 years, moved away for four, and I came back, and the 215's still not done. (laughs) And as I would drive on the 215 with my GPS, I'd be driving, and because it didn't line up correctly, next thing you know, I'm in the middle of the road doing 55 miles an hour, right? I think that's the speed limit on 215, I don't know. And all of a sudden, what would it say? Go left. Now, if I was to go left, where am I going? Into the other lane. I read a story recently in San Diego where this guy was following the GPS in his rental car only to take a right and realize he was going down some railroad tracks and got stuck. Thankfully for him, he got out in enough time to grab his golf clubs, but the car didn't make it. And the train conductor was like, we got to figure this out. Somebody is going to die. And when it comes to your spiritual life and the voices you are listening to in your spiritual life for their spiritual uh, direction, if you're not following the wrong thing, guess what? It's worse than a train track. I'm just being honest. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and what he has done and we put them on ourselves or some other philosophy or ideology, thinking that's going to make up what's what's lacking in Jesus as if there's anything lacking in Jesus, guess what? You're heading into oncoming traffic. It's not safe. When my kid was little, uh, when my son was little, he almost stepped in front of a car. And as I was watching him uh, about ready to step out in front of this car, he didn't see it. I screamed out, Caleb, stop. And by the grace of God, my son went like this and just stopped. He was scared to death and the car went by. And the most loving thing I could have done in that moment was to yell at him. And in the same way, the most loving thing Paul can do for these Galatians is yell at them because he loves them. He needs them to hear. There is a poisonous, deceptive, false religion taking them away from their true love. He goes on to talk about how this gospel changed his life in verse 13. Listen to what he says. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people, So extremely zealous I was for the traditions of my fathers. Paul's bad deeds, if you will, were so bad they were famous. People had heard of it. He says, you have heard of my former life. He was kind of a big deal. 
The Christian church was scared to death of him. He would go in and literally try to destroy it. He was a terrorist. How many of you have seen Shark Week? Right? Have you seen a shark rip the flesh from an animal? How many of you just watch National Geographic? I mean, my son and I, will sit there. We think that's the awesome part. Like when the impala or whatever the thing is, the deer gets away, we're like, oh, I mean, we're just kind of weird, right? <laughs> but that was Paul's intention with the church. The idea, be- by, the idea behind ripping flesh, the idea of destroying something is the word that is used here. That was Paul's intention for the church. And the church was completely scared to death of him. In Acts chapter 7, we read of the Apostle Paul overseeing the the stoning, and just like Ty clarified, we'll clarify, not like Colorado, um, actual throwing rocks to kill somebody of a guy by the name of Stephen. And what does it say in Acts chapter 7 Paul did? He ran the coat check. He's like, here, let me hold your coat so you can wind up and throw harder. You look over in Acts 26, it says he would throw Christians in prison and then he would cast a vote to do what? Kill them. He hated the church. I mean, when he became a Christian, it wasn't like the church just went, hey, come on in. They were still scared of him. They're like, wait, is he faking? I mean, they're praying like this. Like, they don't bow their heads. They're going, who's this guy? Paul says, I was a bad, bad man. But he also says in the same verse, he was a very good man. He says he was fanatical in following the traditions of his, of his people. He says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous. I mean, he was part of the strictest, most conservative religious sect, and he said there was nothing I did in that that would keep me away from God, so he thought. He kept the rules. He crossed the T's. He dotted the I's. He got all the stickers on the Bible chart. And he says, I was better than any of them. In this single verse, here's what we see. Your good works cannot earn God's grace. Man-centered religion is surrounded with the word I. I memorized this. I served. I attended. Paul says, if you really think man-centered religion works, if you really believe that, you're like on the freshman squad compared to me. I'm on the varsity. I've been there. I've done that. And many of us think, because we don't drink, cuss, smoke, or chew, or date guys or girls that do, we're good. That's going to get God to smile upon us. But here's what I want you to know. No matter how much you exert energy, no matter how much you exhaust yourself trying to make yourself good to God, It's not going to work. I got a one-hit wonder in this sermon. (laughs) It's not going to work. You can clean yourself up. You can make yourself right, but it's no good. What you need to do is what Paul eventually did is to trust in the completed work of Jesus for you. I have this written in my notes. I exerted all my might and energy to be good enough, perfect enough, only to discover it wasn't enough. Jesus did it all, friend. Stop trying to earn your way to God, but entrust yourself to the one who earned it for you, Jesus. For Jesus in his life and on the cross perfectly obeyed the Father for you and has gifted his perfection to you so that when the Father sees you, he smiles upon you because he sees the perfection of Jesus that has been lavished upon you. In Christ, God is fully pleased with you. He awakened your dead heart to beat with love for Jesus, and that's a miracle. The question you gotta ask yourself on a day you lost an hour of sleep and you drove in here and you probably sinned, how is God looking upon you right now? Is God smiling upon you or is he scowling at you? And the way I know if you're entrusting yourself to the gospel or you're entrusting yourself to your works and your actions is how you answer that question. Because if you're in Christ right now, God is smiling upon you. He loves you. And your good works can't get you there. But what we also see is your bad deeds can't outrun God's grace. For Paul says he persecuted the church violently. And when you look at the Bible, 
and you read the Bible, do you realize most of those verses are written by guys who had a problem with hurting people, killing people? I mean, wasn't David a murderer? Wasn't Moses a murderer? Wasn't Paul a murderer? And here's what I'll tell you. If that offends you right now and you're going, how dare you talk about those people? How dare you say God's grace is for them? You don't get the gospel. Jesus doesn't come to save well people. Jesus comes to save sick people. People who are sick and ridden with sin. That's who need Jesus. And Jesus saves the apostle Paul and he says, guess what? You're gonna be my representative to show that I can save anyone. One theologian writes it like this, and I love this. He says, no one is so good that they don't need the grace of the gospel, nor so bad they can't receive the grace of the gospel. Paul shows us here that the gospel calls us out of religion as much as it calls us out of irreligion. It calls the good and the bad, the saintly and the evil. In verse 15, Paul says, but, I just wanna stop there because I like the buts of the Bible. And when you hear that, it needs to be a moment of rejoicing because you know what the bud is there for? To show that the gospel is a rescue. Right now we're in March Madness and we see people do last second buzzer beater shots, right? And we've seen some, Oklahoma, shoot, but what happened? The time ran out of the clock and there was a rescue for the other team. When my dad showed up at my house in Salt Lake City and said, I have cancer, my heart sunk, but he said, but it can be treated. How many of us have heard, hey, they were in a car accident, but nobody was hurt. You see, usually the but in the scripture reveals good news, and we just sang it. The scriptures say in Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy. What did he do? But when he who set me apart before I was born, who called me by grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He says, but God, be, but God, before I was even born, before I even could do good or bad, God had set me apart. God had come on a rescue for me. You see this in the prophet Jeremiah, who was set apart from the womb. Je- Paul did not see any sort of thing within his calling that made him go, woohoo, I want to do that. There wasn't a great 401k option. He didn't volunteer for it. He hated Jesus, but God in his grace showed up in his life and performed a rescue on him. And the reason you gotta ask yourself is why? Why did God wait so long in Paul's life to bring rescue into his heart? Why did God wait so long to rescue Paul? Well, I'll tell you why. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, whom I am in the foremost. This is Paul writing this. But I receive mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. Why did God wait so long? To show you that you can never outrun his grace. For if Paul could be saved, if Paul could be beloved by God, if Paul could be rescued, guess what? So can you. Some of you in here are still doing the comparison game. And you look at me and you say, Travis, I don't get it. Why would he love me? Do you know what I've done? And I think Paul would stand up here and go, did you kill any Christians lately? No? No, really? Why did he still love me? Why did he wait so long? For Paul's joy and your joy and ultimately his glory so that you could experience the grace of Jesus. Deuteronomy 7 says, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people, for you were the fewest of all people, but it's because God loved you. God loves you. And he says he called me in his grace. When God makes a call, guess what? It gets answered. I call my kids to the dinner table. 
they don't come. I look at my dog and I call her to go outside to go to the bathroom and she looks at me like I'm an idiot. I call my son to answer his phone and he does not answer it. But when God makes a call, it always gets answered. And he says, he called me by his grace. The acronym for grace that I wanna share with you quickly, I love is simply this, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. How did he call Paul? Not because of any good deed he saw in Paul, but because of the goodness of his son and what his son did for him on the cross and through the resurrection. That's how he called Paul. And he opened his eyes to see the gospel. He goes on, or what we also see here <coughs> quickly is we also see the purpose in his calling to do what? To call him to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And what we see in this is that though Paul was a sinner, though Paul was a rebel, though Paul was a terrorist, God did not waste anything in his life, but used everything in his life for the ultimate purpose to do what? To proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. That's you and to me. And what I love is this quote by Tim Keller when he says this. He says, God does not love us because we are serviceable. He loves us simply because he loves us. This is the only kind of love we can ever be secure in. Of course, since it's the only kind of love we cannot possibly lose, this is grace. God did not call Paul to the Gentiles to earn something back or to pay anything back, but he called him out of the love he had for him and to the purpose to share the love that he did in his heart with other people. And there are things that you have gone through in this life, guys. Each of you have a story, and God does not allow any of that to go to waste, but he uses it for his purposes and for his glory to give you a passion to share him with somebody else. I can remember the first time I preached. No, I didn't preach. I was a kid. I was in elementary school. That wasn't a sermon. I need to correct that. You'd be like, whoa, man, set you apart from the womb. No. <clears throat> No, I was far from Jesus then. But I remember the first time I spoke in front of a school. As I was talking, I was shaking so bad like this, the teacher had to come over and hand, grab my arm for me so I could actually read my paper to the school. And I find it funny because of the grace of God in his life, or in my life. I don't have to have anybody hold my arm anymore. I was the captain of a lot of my soccer teams growing up. God didn't allow any of this to go to a waste. He even used aspects of my life when I wasn't walking with him to equip me for the calling he was gonna do through me. <clears throat> he goes on in verse 18. He says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. He's basically saying, guys, we didn't have time to, to play telephone game. He goes, I knew my gospel. I didn't have to go up there and get it from them. Verse 20, in what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. I love that because that's like a courtroom statement. He's like, hey man, I'm innocent of this charge. Verse 21, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches in Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to be persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. You see, Paul did the religious game, and it didn't work. And what Paul has showed us clearly is it's not your good deeds or your bad deeds. Neither of those things can keep you. One can't get you into God's grace. One can't keep you in, uh, from God's grace. It's all because of Jesus. And when people saw the change that the gospel took place in Paul's life, what did they do? They glorified God. They praised God. And the moment I became a Christian, I saw my parents glorify God in a way I've never seen them glorify anything. Because the way I grew up, I would probably relate more to the bad side of Paul. I was the kid who the more angry I got, the more pain I put on my family. I remember years ago talking to my mom in a car and I said, mom, why didn't you send me away in high school because of the pain I was inflicting on my family? She said, Travis, here's the deal. The more we loved you, the more you hurt us and we couldn't figure it out. And we were going to send you away, but. And when I was 15 years old, the but God 
being rich in mercy saved me. And I watched my mom and dad get baptized in a pond. And a few years later, after my dad kept faithfully sharing the gospel with me, he baptized me in that same pond. Now, my dad didn't have his entire theology worked out. He held me under for a long time. I came up and I was like, what'd you do that for? He said, we gotta get it all out of you. <laughs> That's not what baptism is. Don't, don't. <laughs> baptism is a public declaration that I'm following Jesus and trusting in Jesus alone. And since that time, God has done a work in my life. But not only did he do a work in my life, but he also did it in my brother's life, my little brother's life. And then guess what happened? Started doing a work in my cousin's life, in my other cousin's life, in my uncle's life, in my aunt's life. And I will tell you right now, that side of the family is glorifying God because they will tell you they are the irreligious, if you will, but God was still gracious to them. So where are you today? What voice are you listening to? What gospel are you running to? May it be the gospel, the only gospel that can bring change the one that is from Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your grace, and we just thank you. I thank you that you saved a punk like me. I thank you, Jesus, that you called me, not because of any good merit within myself, but because of your sheer grace. And so Jesus, I pray for uh, my friends out here today, not knowing where they are. I pray that you just uh, awaken some for the first time to the good news of your gospel, that on the cross, Jesus, you paid for it all, died for it all, and rose again. And God, I pray for those who are taking their eyes off of you, that you keep pushing them back to the cross. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for this grace. We pray this in your name. Amen.